paar Leute sind schon da. Das ist gut so, ne? Irgendwas hattest du gesagt, ich habe es nicht verstanden. Okay, ist gut. Okay. 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 Ja, ja, aber also zu früh fange ich jetzt nicht an. Das ging zu schnell mit der PowerPoint. Ja, ja. Das hatte ich extra gehofft, so ein kleines Moment von Suspense einzubauen. Mhm. Und mal das hat geklappt. Also so 35, 40 Minuten oder sowas hast du gesagt. Ja, genau. super. Ja, ja. Ja. Okay. Ja. Und dann gibt es schon Q&A. Machst du dann erstmal oder wie, wie habt ihr das gemacht? Ja, mal schauen. Also okay. Okay. wenn mal schauen. Okay. Äh, ja. ich, also ich kann auch mit irgendwas anfangen. Vielleicht ist das ganz gut. Gerne. Ähm, also wie du. Wie du also in der Hoffnung, dass mir was einfällt. Ähm bei eher. <lacht> du kennst ja schon den Text theoretisch. <lacht> ähm, ja. Genau, aber dann nehme ich an, dass hier. Also es sind doch einige gekommen. Uh, welcome to the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Philip Mueller. I'm working at the Hamburg Institute um, as a historian in the research group for um, on democ democracy and statehood. Uh, I will briefly <laughs> introduce um, our guest, um, our tonight's guest, um, but actually many people would probably say that I do not need to introduce Kiran Patel. Um, he's at home and well known on all the European seas and I believe that this is true. So therefore, um, I will actually not introduce him, uh, at least not in a conventional way. Uh, rather, I will explain why I believe that um, Kiran has something important to tell us within the context of our conference, Beyond the Progressive Story, Reframing Resistance to European Integration, that started today and will continue until Friday. I was extremely happy, Kiran, uh, when you accepted to give the keynote lecture. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for being here. Let me highlight three points uh, to explain why I believe that it is important in the context of our conference uh, to have you with us. There are actually more points. My apologies for being selective, but I want to be brief. <laughs> we are all very much looking forward to your lecture because you have been beyond the progressive story when you started working on European integration history many years ago. That is, when you started working on your first book dealing with the common agricultural policy. In that book, you show that farmers' federations have resisted European integration and contributed to Europeanization precisely by resisting. They Europeanized against their will. That is the title of, of the book, and that captures in a nutshell much of what we have started to discuss today and will continue to discuss in the, common, in the, um, in the days to come. You have then generalized the concept of Europeanization in an important edited volume showing that Europeanization does not simply describe a process that was limited to peaceful um, or progressive developments. Europeanization and de-Europeanization are part of one and the same story. Since we're in Hamburg, uh, let me repeat your reference in the, in the, in the introduction um, of the book to Tidal Europe, um, the ebbs 
and flows of European integration cannot be subsumed to a linear form of progress. Finally, the title of your 2018 monograph on Project Europe points to another dimension of the questions that concern us here. European integration emerged from plans that were only partially realized, that had unintended consequences, that had to be recast on several occasions, as it is with projects. Actually, Kiran and I have met several times by chance in recent years. Um, once in the Widener Library at Harvard University, working around the same bookshelf in the dark. Uh, but then also, on the day of your application at Ludwig Mu uh, Maximilian University in Munich, where you now hold the chair of European history of the 19th and century, uh, 20th centuries. I really happened to be in Munich that day, uh, and all of a sudden stood in front of you on the platform of the um, Munich subway. Now, could one tell this as a story of progress? Um, well, I guess one would have to get many twists and turns of coincidence um, out of the way, and I guess that is actually the task that historians of European history have to face. I'm very much looking forward to seeing how you tackle the questions of European integration history tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, for these very kind words, an introduction that I will endeavor to deserve. Um, it is lovely to be back here, and I should say for those of you who are kind of, who just are joining us this evening, that this conference that we're having is really inspiring, and that I'm learning a lot, who've been working in this field for quite some time, that it is fantastic to have this mix of more experienced scholars and also new PhD projects that really probe standard stories and show how fruitful it is to work on this project of going beyond this progressivist narrative on European integration. Now, we had slight problems with the PowerPoint, and I hope it's going to work, and it does. That's fantastic, because I would like to start with Churchill's underpants, or slightly more precisely, with the 25th of November in the scenic city of Strasbourg. On that day, several thousand, mostly young people, took to the streets to call for a more united Europe. Several months before, the Council of Europe had held its first session in that very city. Demonstrators flew, as you can see on this picture, the flag of the then European movement with its capital green E. You can see the E, you can't see it's green, but it is actually. Factually, again, at the time nicknamed as Churchill's underpants, given the British politician's famous Zurich speech in favor of European Federation some four years earlier, and also given the engagement of his son-in-law, Duncan Sands, in this European movement. Still, I should say, the atmosphere was far from happy, and the people flying Churchill's underpants did not come in peace. Paul Henri Spack had to find out the hard way that day. At the time, the Belgian politician, who is often praised as one of the founding fathers of a united Europe, was the president of the Consultative Assembly of the Council of Europe. And when the demonstrators reached the council's premises, he improvised a speech to greet them. But as soon as the eminent statement started to address the crowd, he was booed, in fact. Many participants later remembered an almost revolutionary atmosphere and also fierce anger. Fierce anger. Some even considered burning down the Council of Europe's provisional wooden building. Frustration and indignation dominated their feelings and discontent with the institutional reality at the European level, which they considered cumbersome, insufficient, and highly problematic. Now, how does this relate to our topic? I think it demonstrates that even the staunchest supporters of European integration were not always convinced that European integration was developing the right way. I've chosen the Council for Euro of Europe and not the European communities as predecessors of today's European Union for this opening anecdote to stress that in some ways this criticism is even older than even the earliest institutional predecessors of today's European Union. But how, I probably have to ask myself, and I want to ask you, how shall we actually define these protesters? Shall we call them Eurosceptics? 
that would not make much sense. And by and large, I do have to say that, and some of you know this, have a real problem with that term. Very often, it is a battle cry of those who are critiquing a certain position. Charles de Gaulle, for instance, had a clear vision of Europe, as was already also mentioned in the workshop earlier this afternoon, but that was obviously very different from the one of Walter Hallstein. Now, does this make Charles de Gaulle a Eurosceptic? And how about those who in 2005 voted against the constitutional treaty, for instance, in the Netherlands or in France? They might have been a kind against any kind of European institutional order. De facto, what they did is that they voted for the status quo and thus for a European Union that was integrated to an extent that any observer some 30 years earlier would have found truly stunning. Who still remembers that the German Social Democrats voted against the ECSC Treaty of 1951, or that the Greens, who joined the European Parliament in 1984, were fundamentally critical of the European community of the 1980s, particularly the Single Market Project, as the most important initiative of the time? I think that these few examples demonstrate that all notions associated with the term Euroscepticism are, in fact, highly problematic. It is not, I argue, a post-Maastricht, i.e. post the Treaty of Maastricht 1992-93 phenomenon. It is not a problem only on the political right. It is difficult, though often ignored, to distinguish between those critical of a certain set of future plans and those disagreeing to the institutional status quo, between those trying to change specific policies and those opposing the process, the status quo of future plans fundamentally. Euroscepticism is a term in our sources and notions of skepticism and anti-Europeanism crop up already in the first post-war year. The art of the two matrices, that is very much the art of political science, for instance, by Paul Taggart and others, reflect political science's love for parsimonious solutions and approaches, if you will. Still, I would argue that the concept of skepticism is really overburdened with normative assumptions. Often, it basically reflects and provides an academic rationalization of the majority position, thus marginalizing alternative ideas of a more social, our ecological stand, as well as, of course, many other political positions. Now, to avoid a clear understand, misunderstanding here, while at a, as a citizen, I do have my clear opinions on which positions I find constructive or even positive, and which I don't, I do think that good scholarship must try to keep distance in its analytical categories from the debates of contemporaries and should not simply reproduce them, basically. For me, again, taking this epistemic and analytical distance from such debates is maybe even one of the main yardsticks of good research. Hence, my criticism that I've already summarized here. I also don't think that pragmatism really helps, even if some contributions in our field, also recent ones, have basically first often summarized the debate very critically also about this term and stressed that there isn't really an intellectually satisfactory answer but then still resort to using the term as an analytical category anyway. I do find that analytically problematic and plea for at least, if you will, a moratorium of sorts. So I would like to propose that we agree not to use the term as an analytical concept for the next, maybe say, five years. And I would argue that if we do so, if we agree to do so, we have more to win actually than to lose. Getting rid of this ill-fitting intellectual corset will open up, and I think this is exactly what this conference is already showing, new perspectives and enable us to see an ever more multifaceted view and also very diverse social practices with which people from all layers of society on diff different geographies interacted with the emergence of the transnational polity that we today call the European Union. Now, as a small conceptual addendum, I would like to add, um, since I'm already in the bashing mode, if you will, that I'm also quite critical of the term democratic backsliding, another term that has risen to prominence over the past years, particularly in political science, um, and that is, of course, very much about the state the European Union is in today. And I would like to address that very briefly from a historian's perspective, my perspective as a historian. I'm not gen wanting to generalize here. The point is that, of course, we do see very, I think, 
or normatively speaking, problematic developments in the European Union with regard to countries such as Hungary, for instance, where, again, the normative basis that has been to some extent established in the European Union is very, very much coming under threat. Now, the question that I only have for us as a scholarly community and beyond also for the public discussion is whether the term democratic backsliding is really very helpful in this context. Why so? Because it basically um, identifies um, organizations such as peace or maybe persons such as Viktor Orban as backward, as regressive, as traditional, if you will. And if you will, this still falls into the whole trajectory of a progressivist narrative, right? Whereby the positive side has the history and history on its side, and that will lead us into the future, whereas these are going back and retreating to an earlier stance. Now, I would argue as a historian that if we look at some of these movements, we see many things that, of course, hark back, and that ideas that we might want to call kind of as an idealization of a given past are part and parcel of these movements. But I would argue that in many ways, these are also very new movements and very new ideas. For instance, with Orban, who does not want to leave the European Union anymore and go back to the old idea of national sovereignty, but is quite comfortable with his country also being in the European Union, but wanting to change that union from within. So in that sense, I would argue, and I'm only taking this as one example, that, again, quite a few of those ideas that these movements stand for are actually quite new, right? And come in new mixes and shapes. And hence the idea to simply disqualify them as something sliding back into an earlier story is to a good extent full with the old kind of modernization theory idea of us moving into an ever more democratic, positive future, if you will, full of teleological assumptions and a normative overdrive that also kind of short circuits certain political ideas with how history should actually look. Again, this is not me speaking as a citizen. I, of course, would also much prefer living in a democracy. But the point is only if these concepts and terms really have analytical mileage, and that is what I would want to challenge. But there was only a little addendum on the side. In what follows, I want to discuss the ways how people in the member states mostly interacted with and viewed European integration. A first step of this short presentation will briefly summarize why existing research sees opposition again to the phenomenon mostly, mostly as a large post-Maastricht phenomenon. Again, this is mostly for those who may be more new to this literature. I know many of you um, have contributed to this literature themselves, and I'm also much indebted to some of you, many of you in this room, who have also informed my thinking about this issue. I will then present a series of perspectives on the role of citizens and underline that support for this European project was actually much more fragile than we have thought so far. I will focus in this part much less on political parties or NGOs, non-governmental organization, as the topics of many of the papers also at this conference, which I think again go a great way in adding also nuance to the standard story about the permissive consensus as a concept to which I will return in a minute um, with their work. Instead, I have set myself the task of discussing the sphere that is maybe the most elusive, if you want, the views and practices of citizens themselves. I will mainly do so again with a focus on member states, and I'm very glad that at this conference we're also having papers that go beyond this scope and open up perspectives to other societies. For instance, pre-accession Greece, Poland, and the former Portuguese empires, to mention that several of them that, that we're listening to here. In doing so, I also argue that we need to assess some of the sources we have more critically than we've done so far, if you will, to read them both with and against the grain, and thus also to import techniques from the history of knowledge and cultural history more broadly into the history of European integration. Now, this is a rather abstract paper, I should say, so I've given you a nice image already, and I'm sorry there won't be many more of this kind in what follows, but I still hope that you bear with me. If not for the talk, just bear with me for the drinks that will follow this presentation.
Now, this brings me to my first session, if you will, to the state of the art. In most of the literature, the Maastricht Treaty of 1992 and the debates it entailed are seen as the starting point of your skepticism, particularly given the initial no to the treaty in Denmark and the extremely thin majority in favor of the treaty in France. Since then, so the standard story goes, it is particularly opposition from the right that has led the European Union into crisis. Now, we've already heard these two names, two friends, political scientists by the name of Lisbeth Hoche and Gary Marx, who argued in 2005 that the ratification crisis of the Maastricht Treaty formed a real transition. And you have here a picture of a happy couple, not just academically, but also privately a happy couple. Now, the historians amongst you should not look at the number of citations of this paper, because that might frustrate us too much. I should only say that it is a very influential paper that has really impact the state of the art fundamentally in this context. Now, the permissive consensus, which had characterized the citizens' view up to that point, so they argue, made way for what they then called a constraining dissensus, seriously reducing the room for maneuver for European politics and politicians. Others in the literature associate with the period prior to Maastricht with the acceptance, or at least the indifference, by the population often building also on Hoche and Marx and referring again for that period to a permissive consensus, which is a term that was first introduced by two US American political scientists, Balian Rindberg and Stuart Scheingold in 1970. Now, Lisbeth and Gary, in their interpretation, have also really kind of, I think, impacted our field as historians. And I would just like to mention one example. Karine Germont, for instance, has recently reproduced, if you will, their interpretation in a 2023 chapter on the history of Euroscepticism and opposition to Europe, as she calls it. And again, it is this very interpretation, much coming from political science, but also certainly of relevance for our own fields, that I want to challenge in what follows. Now with this, let me come to the empirical core of my paper. And I have to admit that at first glance, everything seems to confirm the permissive consensus argument because I will focus in this presentation on the period of the Cold War. Given the largely technocratic character of the early communities, citizens, I would also acknowledge, weren't really much involved in EC politics. Yes, there were moments of crisis also during the first four decades of European integration after 1950, but they were not really triggered by citizens' attitudes, but mostly within the realm of elite politics and rifts between the member states. Think most obviously of the crisis of the empty chair in 1965-66, a typical maneuver of elite politics in which, again, French President Charles de Gaulle unilaterally decided to immobilize the European institutions for half a year. Zooming in on citizens specifically, the existing opinion polls on the issue also show us approval ratings that are, in fact, consistently high, again, supporting, if you will, the permissive consensus argument. In 1950, for example, a survey in 12 Western European states found that 63% supported the objective of European integration. In the six EC member states in 1970, it reached even 87%. Even in later years, the figures remained consistently above 60%, although with tangible, I should admit, differences between the member states. European integration was and is always viewed through the filter of national and subnational categories. But again, I want to say and admit that, of course, at first glance, one could still argue that a lot speaks for the permissive consensus and maybe even support argument. Now, my point is slightly more critical, and I would want to show in what follows that this data is actually quite problematic. And again, this is where my critique really starts. Strong approval rates were also instrumentalized, this is my starting point, to legitimize the integration process, including its more technocratic aspects. Good results at the time, whenever they were taken, these um, uh, results, could be interpreted as evidence of the institution's acceptance as well as a mandate also to disseminate new proposals and push integration further. The surveys often also possessed a prospective element, frequently asking the citizens about their opinions with regard to further steps of integration. For example, at the end of the 1960s, they wanted to know 
what people thought about establishing a European army, a shared currency, and direct elections to the European Parliament. Support in such opinion polls was quickly then transformed in the political arena into a mandate to call for further steps of European integration. In this way, and I think this is what we need to acknowledge, that these opinion polls were not kind of, if you will, just objective and naive. They became tools of information evaluation, but also of power. Some researchers have therefore argued that these opinion polls are too problematic a source for historical research and simply should be ignored. And I personally don't really agree. I think, again, just as historians in other fields have learned, for instance, to read the colonial archive with, again, I've used this metaphor before, with and against the grain, European history has to assess such documents critically and to draw lines that remain hidden also in the official material. Now, if one tries to approach the sources from this vantage point, the first thing that is striking is the gap, I think, between nominal support and actual knowledge with regard to the European communities. For example, most of the population responded with disinterest to the Treaties of Rome, which from today's perspective certainly represents a quantum leap in European integration. In West Germany, according to a survey from January 1957, only 49% had ever heard of the common market and the European economic community. And only 17% were able to give correct answers when asked what these terms actually meant. In January 1958, the corresponding figures were 56 and 21%, so no real fantastic big rise. Now, only 20% were certain that the treaty in question also had been signed. So also that very basic fact wasn't clear to people. And West Germany wasn't alone in its ignorance. Matters were not much different elsewhere. In France in May 1957, only 23% were able to say what Euratom was, even though the French government was especially keen to establish a community for the peaceful use of nuclear power. That could have been a definition of this whole thing. A survey in 1962 confirmed that strong approval uh, the, that strong approval need not necessarily correlate with knowledge. Many people fundamentally liked, and this is a quote, the idea of European unification. But as soon as discussion turned to details, their opinions became very vague. When asked to name concrete effects of the EC, 77% of Italians were unable to name anything concretely positive, while nobody at all named anything negative. In Belgium, France, and West Germany, the corresponding figures were 59 to 97, 60 to 93, and 60 to 84 percent, so I think in a rather similar range. By the end of the decade, when the Commission conducted a comprehensive survey, the situation was hardly any better. 87% approved more or less strongly of the integration process, 27% of, of them strongly, but only 36% were able to correctly the name of the six member states. So in a nutshell, I want to argue that saying yes to Europe did not mean very much because one didn't even know the very basic facts about this process. Now, approval was thus often very little more than lip service. People supported the integration process as long as it remained abstract and had little impact on their own daily lives. As soon as matters became more concrete, and I think this is what you can see on this slide here, the approval ratings fell significantly. Nothing illustrates this better than the surveys from the Netherlands, France, the United Kingdom, and West Germany from the early 1960s. Again, large majorities everywhere fundamentally supported European integration. But when asked about these specific measures, the figures often dropped by 10 to 20 percent, and that um, most consistently in the United Kingdom, where they were higher, um, at least in this period of time. Negative integration in the area of the economy, in other words, dismantling trade barriers, was one of the most popular concrete measures, as you can see here. Integration steps involving social redistribution and supranational cooperation in the field of foreign policy was much less popular in comparison, even if they still commanded majority approval in many countries in this period of time. This trend continued in later years. If we consider the period before the Maastricht Treaty, there are several interesting findings, I think. Firstly, nominal support for the integration process remained consistently high, as you can see here, 
although certain fluctuations can certainly be identified. Moreover, there is no clear upward trend, which is also interesting for this period. So one could not argue that the EC was an immediate success or a snowballing popular support as it grew and developed. I think, secondly, it is conspicuous that there was a striking gap in this phase between general approval of European unification, approval of the interviews, one's own country's membership, and personal affinity to the EC. The discrepancy was especially large between abstract support for integration on the one hand and concrete support for the EC on the other, as revealed by the crucial question of regret over possible failure, as you can see here. If we examine this question at the level of the member states, the difference between the two figures was between 25 and 35% in most countries across that period as a whole. Despite differences of degree, citizens everywhere identified considerably less with the EC than actually with the abstract objective of European unification. In fact, the relationship between citizens and the EC remained primarily, I think, a non-relationship. The Stoic philosophers of ancient Greece would have called the Essene adiaphoron, a matter, if you will, that has no moral merit or demerit. For all the support for Europe, that was the attitude of the overwhelming majority of about the European community during the Cold War, and that perspective, I think, has repercussions to this very day. From there, let me now go one level deeper and discuss what I would like to call semantic demobilization in and also through opinion polls. I would like to argue, again, working with this kind of source, that the methods of contemporary opinion polls provide a key explanation, actually, for the citizens' indifference at the time, underlining the need to read such sources also against the grain. At the time, Eurobarometer normally asked about the degree of support to the, and now it's important what use term they use, the unification or the idea of unification in Europe. These terms, I think, were utterly vague and semantically very open. They were much less precise than political goals such as the European federal state or also the political status quo of the existing institutions those more fine-grained questions were carefully avoided by and large, while unification could mean a whole host of very different things. It could mean the European Free Trade Association, EFTA, as a rival institution to the EC. It could mean a form of cultural association, maybe even one transcending the Cold War divide, or for instance also many forms of interstate cooperation that place civil society front and center, such as city twining, um, where citizens often liked um, the realities much more than those of the institutions of the EC. Um, Ronald Engelhardt, Jacques René Rabier, and Karl-Heinz Reif, amongst the leading opinion pollsters of the age, had to concede themselves that the reference points of pro-European support was, and this is a quote, a floating reference. They admitted that, but they did not admit that this, of course, also significantly reduced the reliability and the informative value of such sort of surveys that they themselves produced. Now, it is in this light that we need to read the low figures for interest in European affairs, this is again a quote, they, because they were, probably would have been even lower if the question had been worded more precisely and asked about the EC-EU. The EC was never the whole of Europe back then, even if, of course, in many sources, they were really put into one category. And, of course, we know that even today that is not really the fact that the European Union is really monopolizing, if you will, all of Europe. This terminological imprecision that you see here also made it so difficult to interpret pro-European statements and surveys simply because it remained unclear which form association of association was being referred to. And if the question was repeated over a span of decades, this suggested, I think, a much larger support for this institutional Europe than actually existed. This might, in fact, explain why such also a nebulous term was chosen in the first place. At the same time, its use succeeded in, the more, strongly in more strongly sidelining the alternatives. For instance, the term glossed over the difference between liberal criticism or also of those who wanted, again, 
slightly more a liberal Europe or those who wanted a more protectionist idea, it also wasn't very precise whether it was about intergovernmentalism or supranational solutions. Reference to the vague term unification glossed over such differences and struggles helped to make them invisible. Ultimately, I therefore argue opinion polls were a means of semantic demobilization. This held even more true because, um, because being against Europe is more and more removed, if you will, from the realm of the, in the realm of the expressible, or one should also say moving into the realm of the inexpressible, or this Unsagbaren auf Deutsch, just as, as it became impossible over the time to be against peace, if you will, or human rights or democracy. So you couldn't say you were against Europe because it was such a catch-all category and was so utterly vague, just as peace and humanity also were. Paradoxically, I therefore claim that it was exactly the opinion polls that helped to depoliticize the EC by removing it from the realm of the political debate. And similar things held true for other levels beyond opinion polls. The kind of analysis traditionally conducted in political science or history to analyze intermediate levels such as parties, NGOs and the like, and we'll have many um, papers on this here, I think sometimes renders rather little a result. Again, sometimes it does, but sometimes not. I think, again, sometimes the analysis of this level does not provide real insights into the actual distance between citizens and European institutions. And for the time since the Maastricht Treaty, Peter Mayer, an Irish political scientist, former colleague who unfortunately passed away much too early, has argued that resistance against the EU in the population um, was there, but that it was, again, hardly reflected in the political landscape. Now, Peter Mayer kind of formulated this with regard to the 1990s and 2000s and called this depoliticization. And I think that his idea, his argument, also holds true for these earlier periods. Let me take the European Parliament as an example. During the Cold War, hardly any party was represented here that really opposed the status quo and further integration in Europe in any principled way. Prior to the introduction of direct elections in 1979, the European Parliament was composed of parliamentarians from various national representations, and in fact mostly of those interested in this very project and open towards the process. During the 1980s, some smaller parties were able to enter the EP that were opposed to the European project in a rather fundamental way, including the aforementioned German Greens. However, I would argue that they didn't manage to change the debate in any fundamental way at the time. And this void mainly had to do with the intricacies of the European Parliament. Ever since the introduction of direct elections, campaigns sometimes addressed the EC's institutional dimensions, yes. But given that the EP had hardly any say on real decisions, domestic issues from the respective member state that people were voting in stood front and center during the campaigns and also for decision-making processes for citizens. For this reason, EP elections have often been called second-order elections. European affairs, so to say, were overshadowed by topics from one's own domestic debate. Regular national elections, which theoretically could have been the bigger kind of trigger to change European policies by changing the course of one's own governments, did, of course, do rather little to fill this void because people made their choices rather based on other criteria than the European polities, uh, politics of that specific um, party. Hence, and here, domestic and other international concerns again outpaced European politics. The period that ex existing research summarizes under the label permissive consensus was thus a time in which the EP and parties ultimately contributed, I argue, to demobilizing and depoliticizing the political space of the community, then rather really filling it with meaningful ways of, of discussing it. The situation in lobby groups was sometimes not so much better because quite a few of them also turned their back on European integration once they realized that they weren't really able to change it in fundamental ways. Again, trade unions would be an example. Philip was kind enough to mention farmers already on which I've worked, where there, I would argue there was resistance, but it was also channeled into European politics in such ways that one would not find it obviously often so obviously, because there was also a way of integrating them into the process that to a large extent, and put the argument short, they were becoming dependent on European funds. 
So many of these interest groups tried to twist the system in their own favor, which also kept fundamental criticism receding more towards the margins. Further reasons for the gap between most citizens and the EC Cosmos were the community's economic focus, its more technocratic aspect, and its remoteness from everyday life. At the same time, it would be false to place face blame on the EC's technocratic tendencies, rather only on power-mad Eurocrats in the European Commission, as one sometimes hear. Frequently, it was namely the member states that blocked greater accessibility, whether in form of direct, more direct participation or more direct democratic control. For instance, again, it was Charles de Gaulle who criticized Brussels as a technocratic behemoth, but of course he had no interest whatsoever in really further curtailing national sovereignty by enabling more direct participation, civil society engagement, or democratic control of that European entity. Moreover, his line on Europe was by no means always backed by clear majorities, so he wasn't simply representing the French idea on what this project should be all about. Surveys in France on, in the course of the 1960s show a consistent majority for British membership, and still this didn't stop de Gaulle from twice using his veto against enlargement um, of the United Kingdom and other countries. In general terms, many national politicians preferred, again, to keep the EC at arm's length, to claim the credit for successes in European processes while blaming Europe, if you will, for most of the problems. Europe, Brussels, one could argue, is painted black in order to allow the nation state to shine. And I think this was also down to the media to some extent, which often played little attention by and large in the broader press to the integration process. Most times the press did not help to politicize Europe by contributing to controversial discussions about concrete issues. And this has to do also with how the media was set up in the 1950s and 60s and we've started to discuss changes in rec more recent periods also at this conference, so that for a long time in many countries, a pro-EC perspective dominated at least some of the leading media. And that made the public also, I think, rather not so much interested in these debates that they were able to read or follow in the media at the time. At the same time, I would argue that European integration was particularly attractive, basically when it did not seem to affect one's own lives too much directly people might have recognized the process's technocratic aspect, which they accepted as long again as they were not really bothered too much directly. European cooperation EC style was based more often on toleration than on genuine approval. Integration remained most popular when it had few tangible consequences for people's own lives. Citizens put up with technocratic aspects and were happy as long as they were otherwise left in peace. Their attitudes towards the EC was more consumptive than really active. Detachment from the citizen theory was a central element of the integration process, notwithstanding the introduction of rudimentary European civil rights in the pre-Maastricht period, even if also at the time most citizens weren't really very much interested in them or noticing them. At the same time, many Europeans preferred to become involved in other things again than the affairs of the EC, for instance, again, in youth exchange programs, town twinning or interrail around the continent or other, other forms of transnational tourism. For important questions that the public had in relation to Europe, the EC, one could simply argue, at the time offered no answers, no platform for civil society engagement of any meaningful kind. The same also holds true if one goes one step further again to referenda and parliamentary votes. The snapshot moments when voters were actually called to the polls also demonstrate how approval for the EC and its predecessors always remained more fragile, I think, than we have assumed for the longest time. And that's suggested by the consensus and then suggested by the consensus of permissive consensus. But first of all, if we start link thinking about this dimension, it is striking, I think, how rarely really the citizens were asked to really go to the polls prior to the Treaty of Maastricht. Many of the shift in the integration process discussed during that very period was never really laid out before the population of the member state. That applied, for instance, to the British accession applications of the 1960s, the Luxembourg Compromise of 1966, or, for instance, the establishment of the European political cooperations in four years later. 
nor were significant community initiatives in the areas like monetary, environmental, or cultural policies, or the stronger orientation on human rights since the 1970s ever really put at the time to a vote. Here again, I think we see the technocratic element. There were, however, parliamentary votes and referendums over various membership applications and the Single European Act. And the results, I think, were not always in favor of further integration, although most referendums and parliamentary votes in the period before Maastricht did produce, in fact, clear majorities for the EC. But there were also, and I think that is important to stress, important exceptions. In 1954, as many of you will know, the French National Assembly voted with a clear 319 to 264 to reject the European Defence Community, which we also discussed earlier this afternoon. Integration research to date has interpreted this as a unique defeat, but again, this, I think, isn't really much correct. A last-minute Norwegian referendum of 1972, after the accession treaty had already been negotiated, rejected EC membership by a 535 majority. Ten years later, Greenland voted to leave the EC by a margin of 53 to 47%. And why the Irish referendum ratifying the Single European Act appeared clear-cut, the complex backstory involved first amending the Irish constitution to accommodate the EC's new structures. Attitudes remained particularly critical, if we zoom in even further, in a number of states that were not among the original six founding countries, a fact reflected in surveys even more clearly than in formal ballots. In 1973, for instance, only 37% of the British supported European unification, although the figure rose for a spell in subsequent years. In 1981, just 24% took a positive view of EC membership. In Denmark, the value was 30%, and in Greece, 42%. Between 1982 and 1985, approval, approval, approval rose significantly in these countries. But there are other examples, like Portugal, where in 1978, before the formal membership application, 60% were unable to say whether EC membership was important for their own country's economy. Altogether, these figures underline again, I would argue, the fragility of support for the EC in these places, even in the 1970s. But again, dissatisfaction remained largely invisible because citizens were, again, so rarely only permitted to vote on imported EC matters. Because, as described above, many knew very little about the community, and while many showed so little interest, it was also, hence, comparably easy to mobilize powerful forces against this project. The EC suffered defeats, especially where, such as in Norway in 1972, the pro-EC camp was over-optimistic and lacked prominent campaign leaders, while the opposition was better organized. The EC could quickly crumble from this adiaphron, if you will, to an object of diverse and often diffuse fears, which often had more to do with also internal social and political conflicts than really with concrete questions pertaining to the European community. This kind of criticism not only prevented further integration moves, but also had the potential to call into question the status quo. Hence, it also did come, of course, as a complete shock to the Danish establishment and also to EU, or EC elites, I should say, more generally, when a narrow majority of 50.7% 50 50 voted on to June 1992 against ratifying the Maastricht Treaty in that Scandinavian country. The heads of state of government of the other member states were deeply disappointed and dismayed. Only British ex-Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, no surprise there, congratulated the Danes on the results. In the research, this defeat for the pro-EC camp, along with the slimness of the French referendum majority, that was at 51%, and the naivete ratification in the United Kingdom, is frequently regarded as a turning point. In the end, the treaty came into effect in 93, after Denmark was then granted opals. But the crisis over the ratification of the Maastricht Treaty was certainly a turning point to the extent that public criticism of the integration um, process assumed new dimensions and new visibility. I would, however, again want to argue that it is only the end of a longer history that we have to assess and see much to a larger extent than the literature has done so far. And this brings me to my uh, conclusion. The question, what does this tell us all for today? Developments that are seen new, I think, in our own times 
in fact, again, have a long prehistory. The debate about problems of the present does not so much reflect really a historical problem, but rather a problematic interpretation of history, of European history more precisely. And this is all the more problematic since it makes the present look all the more new and different, the less one knows, if you will, about the past. Admittedly, the problem of party participation in support of and control over the integration process by the citizens of the member states or by institutions and procedures they accept is now ever more urgent than in earlier periods. This is because, of course, the European Union today has an immensely greater and at the same time considerably larger significance for wheel and woe of whole societies than it still had in the 1970s and 80s. At the same time, of course, a technocratic solution always remains an important option for EU elites, as we've also seen very recently during the Euro crisis, the pandemic, and I think also the ongoing war in Ukraine. Against this backdrop, I've argued that support for European integration has always been quite fragile, also long before the Maastricht Treaty. Still, we're only beginning to find out more about this, as we're doing at this conference and in the wider project funded by the German research ministry that you're part of, and thus overcoming one of the remaining bastions, if you will, of an earlier literature that had these strong federalist and by tendency also very normatively grounded um, under overtones. It had internalized some of the EC and EU's ideas, also this motto of an ever closer union, and did not really pay so much attention to forces and dimensions that were pointing into other directions. Still, there was much more indifference and also much more criticism and opposition to this beast, if you will, than we've thought so far, as it again is, uh, and also more than is summarized in this idea of the permissive consensus. Hence, I propose, and this is the title of the presentation, to put the idea of the permissive consensus to rest, um, and maybe also your skepticism, and also maybe democratic backsliding, because these categories I do not think have so much intellectual mileage. And I would argue that freed from such concepts, at least for a number of years, we should ask new questions. For instance, any critical assessment of the period must include, again, an analysis of the forces and dynamics that were active in demobilizing potential opposition from the linguistic and semantic levels where it became increasingly difficult not to support Europe, whatever that might have meant in concrete terms, to other forms also of demobilization, for instance, via the media or intermediary levels in the political system, such as parties, which also tended to create rather little room for such criticism. Having said all this, I do not want to deny that the political debate today has become much more toxic over the past 20, 30 years already, and that hence we should also see that some of these things are different today than in the past. So I don't want to simply say the peer history that we want to look in is simply the same as it is today, but I still think that there is value in looking into that prehistory in new and different ways. Considering the fragile foundation on which European integration rested from the beginning, its development, therefore, in the end, I think, is all the more astonishing. It reflects also, and this is another topic that one could discuss in more detail, a degree of resilience that would have deserved, again, another uh, paper, if you will. Suffice to say that this resilience can also be seen in a strength of today's European Union. However, at the same time, the decades-old distance of the apparatus from the citizenry should um, still be considered because I think it hasn't really been overcome and also recent attempts to do so, such as this conference that we had last year, have been utterly unsuccessful in closing that gap, if you will. So this is a fundamental problem that exists to this day. I do not think also that it will be possible to go beyond this fundamental politicization that we've seen, particularly over the last three decades, even if some would argue that it would be nice, if you will, to go back to the older days, to what, again, some in the literature would describe as a period of polemicist consensus. And again, I would argue that this is wrong because there was, again, no golden pro-European age to return to, to also pick up a com concept and idea coined by Mark Gilbert and Elie Pascinucci. And I think that honest and kind of proper research can only help us to show the intricacies and the details of this complex process, which makes this topic also much more relevant 
um, four European historians or historians of Europe who not specialize, do not specialize um, in this specific subfield. So in that sense, and this is my last sentence, I think this conference is a fantastic opportunity to also help kind of the specific concerns in the subfield of European integration history to broader questions in European history, um, be it by looking more at the role of the media, the legal dimensions, also non-European dimensions that I wasn't addressing in this presentation today, that, uh, but to which we might also come back to in a moment. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions and comments. short moment <laughs> to, uh, for everyone to to gather their their thoughts um, let me maybe um, start with a first question and uh, see where that gets us and I'm very sure that there's many people in this room who would who have questions uh, um, to ask um, now I was very impressed by by the picture and by um, the way uh, you <coughs> you argued that permissive consensus is not really working. Um, can I ask you to um, try and explain whether the European communities um, and maybe also the European Union was especially, well, how to put this, well equipped to demobilize opposition uh, and to make opposition invisible? Uh, because from a certain point of view, one could argue that uh, demobilizing opposition was a concept very popular um, in post-war democracies in Western mm -hmm. Europe all over. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know the book by Jan Werner Müller, mm -hmm. um, uh, who has argued in that direction. Mm -hmm. But it, it does seem mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you know the European communities mm -hmm. and and uh, the, the European Union were in some way. Uh, more successful, maybe. <laughs> so is there a difference in demobilizing from a European and from a national perspective? Right. Um, I think a very relevant question, and I'm glad that you brought up Jan's research, because I think, again, this <laughs> dimension of demobilization is not one that is specific to the EC as such. Um, and what we've also started to discuss is, of course, similar patterns, particularly in the earlier post-war periods, in the first one or two decades post-45, at the national level. For instance, again, for Germany, when it comes to also to the role of the media, maybe in Italy for slightly longer, and we could go on talking about the various case studies. Now, I would think that, firstly, one could argue at the EC level that worked longer. Mm -hmm. So the kind of dimension of giving voice to diversity of positions that you find a kind of gaining momentum in at least the second and then the third certainly post-war decade across many Western European countries as nation states is something you find to much lesser degree at the EC level. And secondly, I think that yes, coming back to the core of your question, there were certain elements that made the EC particularly well equipped to be mobilized. What do I mean? I think particularly it had to go do also with a dimension that has long been overlooked in the literature because the literature for a long time has looked particularly at political negotiations, if you will, through the lens of diplomatic history and to some extent economic history. Mm. And what I am referring to here is the history of knowledge. So the history of statistics, for instance. Again, things that might seem rather innocent at first glance, such as these Eurobarometer polls, for instance, where I think what we've started to see by having also bringing in more cultural history perspectives and trying to assess also the criteria on which these statistics were built, that again, these elements of demobilization were built into these opinion polls. Again, referring to the term un European unification would serve as one example in this context. And again, I think um, the very fact that these uh, kind of this knowledge was created by these institutions, which then, of course, also used their own channels, political channels, if you will, to disseminate them in the member states and beyond, proved to be a powerful element. And of course, there were these other inbuilt mechanisms where there was also no master plan, if you will. So it's not a big conspiracy theory only, 
um, that had these effects, such as, again, the fact that the European Parliament didn't have a big political role. Mm. And that was, of course, because the member states didn't want that to, to be different. And that also led to demobilization. And I think what we've also seen is moments of frustration, which I haven't mentioned in the presentation so far. If we fast forward to from the period that I've dis uh, dis uh, described and analyzed here for you to the most recent past, uh, the Spitzenkandidaten model would be a fantastic example, where you saw also in the European in the last EP elections um, in 2019 a lot of mobilization, and many of you or all of you will probably know that for the first time basically since direct elections, the number of participation went up again. Um, and before that, it was always falling. So in that sense, there was a moment of mobilization. But I think basically it also fundamentally backfired. Why so? Because you had that model um, of Spitzenkandidaten that was based on a rather shaky legal basis in the Lisbon Treaty. And as a result, of course, you didn't have the Spitzenkandidat of the strongest kind of alliance of parties um, um, transnationally then being elected or chosen as president of the European Commission that would have been Manfred Weber, but somebody else. And that was more, you know, the usual kind of wheeling and dealing backstage policies that probably really frustrated a lot of people and will also make a third iteration of the Spitzenkandidaten um, uh, model next time around ever more complicated. So in that sense, I think there is also this experience of frustration that one has certain hopes, and this is certainly what I try to show with my opening slide, with uh, people again with the um, European flag, if you will, of the times, who then were frustrated that what they were hoping for was not achieved in that institutional reality. So the big hopes that might have been associated also with war and peace, with human rights and so on, were of course delegated to other entities and were not realized in that European community if we talk about the period of study that, that I was presenting here. So let me look if there's, oh, Antonio, yes. Uh, the historical Euroscepticism. Mm -hmm. So you were talking also about mm -hmm. this change of things in the mm -hmm. last 20 or mm -hmm. 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I was just, um, I mean, I cannot ask you, what do you think is the cause for this, for the rise of historical Euroscepticism in the sense that there are political mm -hmm. parties that strategically mm -hmm. use the term mm -hmm. to define themselves. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so we see, so like, I, I also have the impression while you were talking that this, the, the, there are like two elements of the, the question of depolitization, which is like the politi depolitization about the institution and about mm -hmm. the issues, like mm -hmm. the policies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. These are two different elements. And then um, actually as, so, um, as soon as the institution become more like strong after mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Maastricht treaties, and we would expect actually a politicization on the issues. Mm -hmm. The institution become super politicized and mm -hmm. there is a stronger position against the institution. So now the question is um, exactly what about the historical area of skepticism? What mm -hmm. we do with that? And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. also building up what you said about the field of European mm -hmm. history and the mm -hmm. subfield of European mm -hmm. integration mm -hmm. history. Maybe we need mm -hmm. causes that are outside mm -hmm. the history of European integration, mm -hmm. which would completely dissolve the field of European integration. Mm -hmm. Let's say, mm -hmm. maybe we would say the reason for the historical Euroscepticism mm -hmm. is not in the European integration, is in mm -hmm. economy or mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. ma maybe neoliberalism is not a good term, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the question is clear. Right. I just okay. said a yeah. lot of things, but <laughs> I hope you can kind of like find the thread. Thank you, thank you, Antonio. I think, yeah, no, I think this, these were very important points. If I got it correctly, it's also about the history of the term, basically, Euroscepticism, and how it's been used by people at the time, right? This is one dimension of your question. I think, again, as I think you were starting to say, what we need is also more research that doesn't follow the trail of these sources only and kind of reproduce these arguments, but also assesses critically why actors in the past have used these terms of uh, Euroscepticism or anti-EU positions um, in strategic ways, either, and that also to some extent only, as self-definitions, but often also to define others, right? And I think these strategic uses are very interesting, and also 
part of what, again, is being started to be analyzed without simply kind of using normative categories ourselves to define these groups in the first place. And I think that is one important constructive way of assessing uh, the situation. Having said that, the ever more complex political landscape in which the institutions are navigating, that's the other dimension of your question, if I understood correctly, is something that, of course, we have to acknowledge. And I think what we have also started to see already this afternoon and will continue tomorrow and the day after is that this has been a defining reality already since the 1950s. And that hasn't really been seen so much or rather framed in other ways. Now, coming to the core of your question, I would agree that, again, so much so far that this historiography has been rather inward looking and really confined to using the parameters of integration as the remit in which one studies the whole phenomenon. And I think that really has to change. So the very fact that, if you will, social movements and protest movements were on the rise, right, make it an almost banal statement that it isn't surprising that also this object became, became more under fire, if you will. Or that, of course, with the changes in the public sphere, as we also were starting to discuss this afternoon, also a more plural assessment or more plurality of voices was made possible in the media sphere. Also with, for instance, the rise of private television, that is only one example, which also made access to some forms of information uh, more easily available for people. And I think there we really can easily link also the concerns that maybe we have when we study this sub-phenomenon specifically, again, the history of European integration broadly conceived to broader questions of European history. And it would be absolutely wrong to keep up these limits. And I think they've been very much has been established because of this focus on diplomatic and maybe it's a little bit of economic history. And the more we go beyond that, the more um, it is also possible to reconnect um, this subfield to other issues. And that, I think, holds particular to the closer we come to the present. And with that, I don't just mean the last 30 years, but certainly the period since the 1970s particularly, when this entity became ever more important and when the interaction and also the impact on European societies became ever bigger. So in that sense, one could also argue that people didn't know much about this entity um, in the 1950s is basically also not particularly surprising because who of us would really be able to really summarize quickly what, uh, say, the OECD is doing these days or what um, the UNECE, and I know that all of you are fans of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, um, what it is doing these days. So in that sense, there is also an incremental gain in power that gave it more relevance and hence also put it on people's radar only over time, basically. I hope that goes into a direction of answering your question. Christina von Hodenberg. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much. <coughs> Just a very quick question. Um, you said that the fact people didn't know much, citizens didn't know much about mm. Europe. Um, mm -hmm. or their ideas were very vague, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was easy to mobilize um, the um, anti-European <laughs> ideas if you tap tapped into national issues. And you seem to have these two poles. It's really the national issues that are salient and European issues that people don't know much about mm -hmm. and that are not very salient. Mm -hmm. What about empires? What about the mm -hmm. European mm -hmm. countries which were part of the right. European Unions mm -hmm. and had empirical, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. imperial or colonial yeah. connections. Yeah. How does that complicate the picture? I think massively. And I'm very grateful, Christina, for you to bring up this question. And I think this is one of the real frontiers um, of research in the next phases, that we need to take this imperial nexus, if you will, much more seriously. Again, I was several times stressing that I was talking about the citizens in the member states um, specifically. But again, I need to remind us probably just for one second, most of you are fully aware of this, that when this whole process started, um, this was not a post-colonial process in the sense that colonialism was over. If it were four of the six original member states still had empires of sorts. And also the original treaties in several ways, be it for Algeria in a specific way, but also for other ex-colonies, um, contained specific stipulations. So in that sense, the whole question of what this meant and how it impacted also people's lives beyond the member states in the strict sense of word 
I think is one of the most interesting. I gave a paper some four weeks ago on uh, on somebody who is a uh, labor migrant from Algeria who then worked in France and Germany and how one can start to trace somebody like his biography through the sources and how it changes the whole image and the whole kind of um, perspective on the topic. So in that sense, I think the easiest way to answer your question is to say that, again, empire was really taken actively out of the picture. And that is also a part of the story that we've tended to overlook so far. But once we look deep into the sources, we find that imperial nexus ever more prominent, basically. And it was also a deliberate dimension of EC policymaking to really make that dimension basically invisible. And there were only these very you know, specific moments where one can glimpse the relevance of this if one starts to look at this process from a non-EC-centric perspective. So this is, I think, one of the really very important new directions the research needs to go, um, where some works have yeah, made great starting points. Again, the Eurafrica book. There is this new book by Megan um, uh, Brown, for instance, on Algeria. There is some other studies, but much more research is needed. Also, for those who then entered the process later, Philip, you will speak about um, Portugal day after tomorrow, but also for Britain, obviously, there is many important questions that have remained unanswered to this day. So maybe uh, let me ask another question uh, uh, that is um, uh, directed in uh, what I'm actually asking is there some sort of development or evolution within the efforts to put uh, to make dissatisfaction invisible um, you know is there a story of, of demobilizing people is there some sort of change within that process. Um, now what I'm first, it's just an idea of, um, you, know, you know, to get my, my, my thoughts going. Um, there's a pretty f well known uh, interpretation. Um, I know that some of us do not agree with it. <laughs> uh, that um, interprets uh, European integration and uh, the European community and the European Union as a machine to liberalize um, mm -hmm. national societies. And the argument sort of goes um, that uh, because several states need to find uh, a common denominator, they will agree on the uh, you know, less difficult point Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and then follow that direction and mm -hmm. liberalize everything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. uh, now, as a consequence, that would that would mean to disregard mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. um, the uh, interests mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and maybe also the uh, views and opposing mm -hmm. views mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. citizens in member mm -hmm. states. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now that. Of course, mm. there is some sort of evolution story in that story because yeah. the liberalizing machine mm. uh, European Union mm. or European mm. community is supposed to have started mm. in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Now, what would mm. your reaction be to that? Mm. <laughs> Again, I think the argument comes in several shades and forms, so one could also attach it to the old rescue of the nation state argument by Alan Millward. Perry Anderson is probably more somebody who you had in mind with his kind Wolfgang of argument. Steg, yeah. And Wolfgang Steg, obviously, yeah. then yeah. for the German context. Yeah. So these arguments have been made. What I find problematic in them is often that there tends to be a master narrative, almost conspiracy mm. argument dimension in them. And I try to show that these processes have many kind of roots and also dynamics and trajectories without there being a core root, if you will, that holds it all together. So in that sense, I think it's all too messy, too bricolage, too patchy, mm -hmm. if you will, to really uh, summarize it that way. Um, I would certainly think that there have been moments, also in recent history, obviously, where the technocratic dimension took over again. But what we see is that, of course, also there is an ever more binding rhetoric of involving citizens. So this whole talk about the democratic deficit, and I think we still need the one history, PhD thesis maybe, that really traces the history of the, the discussion about the democratic deficit properly, mm -hmm. um, is something that rose in the 1970s, has been with us ever since. Also, I think, 
builds on a very specific notion of democracy that I find problematic because it's basically modeled on the nation state and a federalist notion. So also that is another context, a concept, if you will, that needs to be historicized and problematized to a larger extent. So also there, I think what you have still is since the 1970s, this counter push. So on the one hand, you have this demobilization factors that I was trying to, 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 to remind us of here, but there is also the, the push for ever more involvement, basically. Mm. And as always, things have been going back and forth, if you will, without the European Union ever finding a clear-cut policy and direction it's muddling through, if you will, um, which is, of course, also the case for many national levels. So in that sense, it's also not the one exception of a political entity that doesn't get it right, if you will. If you look at the situation, um, think about the Bundestag reform in this country, think about the situation in the United Kingdom, in the United States, there are zillions of examples where you also see that the polity, so the way things work, if you will, at the level of the political entity are very much in crisis and on construction and discussion. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, also there, going maybe also back to Antonio's question, I would not argue this is the one out, basically. It is particularly interesting because the level of impact that the European Union has acquired over the past decades, I think is unparalleled by any other entity of this kind, i.e. a regional international organization. I wouldn't know of anyone that had this kind of impact on society. So that makes it somewhat specific, but it's, again, not exceptional. We were having discussion also this afternoon in the sense that it is worse, necessarily, or fundamentally different to some of the dynamics that we also see at the level of, of specific, of other, I should say, political entities, including nation states, mm. if that goes into the direction of an answer. Mm. More questions? Okay, I can't see any. Or drinks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess everybody's uh, sort of hungry <laughs> or thirsty or both. Um, so, Kilan, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I think uh, this will be with us uh, within the next few days. Um, uh, uh, for those of you um, uh, who uh, participate in in the conference uh, we have dinner downstairs um, for everyone in the room thank you very much for your interest for uh, visiting the Hamburg Institute for social research uh, we would be happy to see you here again and um, as I say good night and good luck <laughs> <laughs>